Hi, in a previous video I showed a very rudimentary hack of one of these infrared learning remote controls and how you could uh, hack in and directly drive one of the buttons which you can pre-program from something like an Arduino microcontroller or anything else, it could be some other external switch or some other external circuitry and that was incredibly uh, simple and rudimentary hack but there were quite a few people who wanted to know uh, how to do that directly from a microcontroller like an Arduino for example itself instead of having to hack a remote control why can't we just can we just put an infrared LED on one of the output pins of the microcontroller and transmit the code directly well yes we can do that and uh, it's not entirely difficult uh, at all so that's what I'm going to show you today how we're actually going to receive a uh, code from my Canon uh, WLD89 uh, remote control for my video camera here and how we're going to uh, capture that on our oscilloscope and then program it into this Arduino. Now there are of course many different ways to skin this cat. I mean you don't have to use an oscilloscope like we're going to use today. You could use a logic analyzer like this uh, Sailey uh, logic analyzer or you could use the Arduino itself for example. You can get libraries that actually read in infrared code from an infrared receiver and play it back. We've got a uh, infra USB, dangerous prototypes USB infra red uh, toy IR toy here which we're actually going to be using to capture the data but that can stream it to a PC and then you can analyze the data on the PC and know exactly what it is and you can get all sorts of open source libraries on the uh, PC to do that you just hook up an infrared uh, receiver to it and uh, there's you know many many different ways to do this but we're going to do it um, the old-fashioned way we're going to actually uh, get our digital scope and we're going to capture the waveform coming out of the IR receiver we're going to get the individual bits from it and the timing and then we're going to program that into our microcontroller so that then we can spit out the IR code now there's two devices you can actually use to receive the infrared code from the remote control. One is just your basic uh, photodiode, infrared photodiode slash uh, photo transistor and they can either come in uh, two lead or three lead configurations like this one here. And these are fairly uh, limited devices but what they allow you to do is to get the actual raw carrier frequency out of the infrared remote control as we'll see but there's also these other three pin devices which are these uh, proper infrared receiving modules and they've actually got circuitry in there that uh, decode and demodulate the carrier frequency and give you a direct data out and we'll see this on the oscilloscope in a second so um, the good thing about this USB infrared uh, toy we can actually uh, probe both of these sensors and see the different types of data coming out now the good thing about these little uh, infrared modules is that you pretty much never have to buy them because you should have them in your junk bin because pretty much any bit of uh, surplus consumer gear for example I've got a, um, a set top box uh, PVR one of those PVR recorders here and if you you know any old bit of gear an old CD player or anything that you salvage will have one of these in it check it out rip it out reuse it not a problem and just be aware that there are different uh, carrier frequency modules but uh, the most common type that uh, you're going to deal with is the 38 kilohertz carrier frequency and we'll actually be able to measure that because we'll be getting the raw uh, data carrier data uh, out of this uh, photodiode here okay we're going to use our oscilloscope to capture first of all on channel one here we're going to capture the output data from the IR module so this is the one that has the demodulator built in it'll take out the carrier frequency as you'll see and we'll just get the raw one zero data out of it now what you want to do this is a uh, five volt one so you want to set it to one volt uh, per division roughly let's put it down here uh, you want to set it maybe 50 milliseconds per division a fairly um, you know slowish uh, time base so we can ta capture the entire packet and then zoom in later and this is where an oscilloscope with a deep memory is going to come in so you know you don't want to use an old school oscilloscope with you know 2k of uh, sample memory or something like that a nice good deep memory uh, scope especially if you're capturing more than one uh, packet so we'll take a look at that but here we go I've got my infrared remote control I've got channel 1 hooked up to the output of that uh, IR module which you can salvage from any bit of uh, gear you want and I'm going to push my uh, start stop button which is the one I want to capture and bingo there it is 
we've captured that. I had it set to uh, single shot mode, of course. Triggering is uh, somewhere in the middle there. And uh, let's, there it is. And uh, we can zoom in and we can see the data coming out of that. Bingo, we've captured that packet. Now look what happens if I do that again and I press the button for a bit longer. Hold it down for a bit. There we go. Look, we actually captured five uh, packets there because if you hold down the button it will continually send uh, the packet and then uh, your product that you're actually um, you know, pointing this out can actually decode that you've press that button for like you know, three seconds or something like that for example like uh, to go into the playback mode on my video camera I've got to push this button here for like three seconds hold it down and then it will go into playback mode so it just sits there counting those packets decodes them and counts it and it knows I've pushed that for three seconds now as you can see here the output of the module is normally high and then it goes low like this so we're getting a zero out of that but what that means, that zero, is that it's actually receiving, because uh, it's a logic low output when it receives a carrier frequency. We'll see this in a second when we probe our uh, photodiode directly. So there's, that means that the infrared, when this is low, when our signal is low, it means our infrared uh, LED is transmitting. So when we decode this data and program it into our microcontroller, decode the ones and zeros, a zero here means switch on the LED at the carrier frequency rate. And likewise, when we've got a logic one up here, then that means the LED is switched off. It's receiving nothing. Now, what I'm gonna do is switch on channel two here, and I've got channel two hooked up to the other, the photo transistor down there, which is gonna give us the direct uh, data from the transmitter here. And of course, we've still got channel one hooked up to our uh, infrared module there so here we go I'm going to press the same button again and we'll capture that data packet there we go so as you can see channel 2 here from that f infrared photo transistor there's a big block there and what that is is the carrier frequency we can zoom in on that see it's practically identical and almost lined up as we'll see so let's zoom in on that so let's move our position over here and zoom in on that first bit it goes low Bingo, there's our carrier frequency. And if we check out our frequency down here, it's decoded that, there you go, 38.4 kilohertz. It's gonna vary, it's not gonna be uh, spot on, but it's roughly that 38 kilohertz carrier frequency. So when we program that into our microcontroller, we need our microcontroller to not just go low and turn on the LED, or go high and turn on the LED, it needs to generate that 38 kilohertz carrier frequency for that amount of time. You'll notice it's done exactly the same thing over here, exactly the same carrier frequency. And you'll also note that the, uh, this blue waveform here is the raw data coming out of our trans infrared transmitter here. So you can see that it starts uh, transmitting, and it takes a few cycles for that infrared receiver module to actually decode that and then give our low output and it extends past there as well. But it's basically the same time period as that uh, whole packet there. So that's just two ways at looking at the same data. So it doesn't matter whether, you, whether you've got just a photodiode, photo transistor, or whether or not you've got one of the proper um, infrared receiver modules. If you've got, just got the module here, just assume that the carrier frequency is in there. When that's low and when it's high, you get nothing. And if you've got the carrier frequency, uh, if you just got the uh, infrared diode, well, you can just decode it exactly the same way. And you notice the time of our burst there, we're on 50 microseconds per division, is just over 550 microseconds. So we can get that exact value. It's, it, it doesn't have to be absolutely spot on, but it should be close. So we'll measure that as accurately as we can. And I've used both my cursors there, and I'm measuring 562 microseconds for that burst. And you'll notice that the dead period there, where it's, well, high, but it's actually switched off, is exactly the same 562 microseconds. Now, you could be mistaken for thinking that these are individual 1010 bits in here, and then you've actually got three zeros here, because if you actually go in there and measure it, this period here is actually, yes, it is precisely three times that length there. So you might think it's one and then zero, 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 but... That's not the case because I happen to know that this thing looks precisely like the Japanese protocol or uh, sometimes better known as the NEC uh, protocol. 
Now the unusual thing about the NEC protocol is it doesn't have a fixed bit length for both 1 and 0. It actually changes between those. So let's take the example of like it's ordinarily high. So let's say the start of the bit is here. It goes low for that 1, we'll call that 1 time period there. Then it goes back high uh, like that. And that represents a 0. But a 1 is represented by it going low like that for that one time period and then going high again for three time periods like that. So that in there, so that from there to there is a zero and from there to there is a one. So it's quite unusual, but that's the NEC protocol. And you don't have to think of it like that, of course. Well, if you're actually uh, programming this into your microcontroller, then you could think of it as you know, one zero one zero zero zero. If you really wanted to, but and you could actually program it and implement it successfully that way. But that just wouldn't be the correct way to do it. Because what we're going to find here is that in the total of all this, we're going to actually have four bytes for a total of thirty-two bits. Now, of course, to decode that on your scope, some scopes, of course, have serial protocol decoding, but I have never seen one that actually has the NEC uh, protocol built in. And if your scope or your logic analyzer or whatever happened to have a custom protocol uh, decoder, for example, then you might just be able to set that up to actually decode it and turn those um, different time length periods into zero and ones for you and spit out that four byte code that the NEC control code actually has. But eh, we don't um, have that capability here, so we're just going to decode this manually. So what we can do is go in here after our idle period, and that's the start of our first bit there. And we can see that that first one is a one, because it's one time period with three uh, blank time periods after that. So that's a one, one, and then zero, 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 zero. And that's called a pulse length encoding uh, technique. So we can go in there and just manually decode these, not a problem whatsoever, and we should get total out of that four different bytes. And I've gone through and manually decoded that, and this is what we get. We get our four 8-bit bytes there. And the first two bytes are the address, so there we go, it sends those. Then it sends the command here, and then the inverse of the command like that. So you should, if you've decoded it right, this last byte should be an inverse of that one, and that's exactly what we see on a bit-by-bit -bit basis. So now we've got this data, we can program it into our micro. Beauty. Now, to throw a real spanner in the works, something like the uh, Philips RC5 IR protocol, for example, each time you press the key, it can actually toggle that bit each time. So, what, I'm, what I've set up here is I've captured this waveform, and there's the, I've stored it as a reference waveform here. So now, I'll press it again and see if we get an identical waveform. Let's have a look. Does it look identical? It does. So I'll do that one more time. No, we don't have any toggled bits. So it looks like it repeats the exact same code every time. You've just got to be careful there. Otherwise, uh, you know, that could really uh, ruin your day and changes the equation on how you're uh, going to write your IR driver and stuff like that. And here's the source code, the sketch I've written for this. Uh, yeah, I could have just used an off-the-shelf uh, library, IR code library. Some of them are quite simple, some are quite uh, complex. There are a lot out there that do support the NEC uh, protocol we're actually after, and a lot of them are complete ones that uh, receive codes and do all sorts of stuff. Um, but I wanted to write my own because, well, that's the spirit of this thing. And as it turns out, it's very, very simple. So I wrote it from Slode, the source code for this, from a link down below the video here. So I'll be very brief on this. I've set up my uh, LED, and my infrared LED on uh, pin. You can just define which uh, pin of the Arduino you've got. I've got my bit time, 562 microseconds, as we saw on the oscilloscope. And then I define the infrared code that I want to send. Uh, in this case, it's that 4-byte, 32-bit uh, code that we retrieve reverse engineered from the oscilloscope. So in binary form, I've got it as one big 32-bit word there. So that's all set up. You could have multiple codes for any command button that you wanted to send. This one is just the reverse engineered code for my Canon remote control uh, record, stop record button. And then I've got a simple uh, setup routine here that just uh, sets up the pin as an output for the LED. 
and then it uh, switches the lead off to start with. And I've got two simple routines, and that's the entire code right there, just in those two routines almost fit on that one screen. A couple of dozen lines of code. The first one is the IR carrier, and that generates 38 kilohertz carrier frequency. All you do is pass at the time in microseconds that you want the carrier frequency to go for, and then it just goes through a for loop and turns the lead off and on there. Not a problem at all. Now it's got to uh, divide that pass time by 26 microseconds here because 26 microseconds is roughly the inverse of the 38 kilohertz carrier frequency that we got. And then all it does is it sets the uh, turns the LED on for half that period or 13 microseconds and then turns it off for 13 microseconds and it repeats as long as it needs to. And then we've got another routine which sends uh, the 32-bit code. So you just pass it the code here as a long 32-bit long value. And then we have the uh, let generate the leading pulse here as we saw on the oscilloscope, 9,000 uh, 9, microseconds. We uh, turn the carrier on for, that's 9 milliseconds. And then we turn the carrier off for 4.5 milliseconds there. So it's we've generated our leading pulse. And then all we do is we go in a for loop here and we send out all of our 32 bits or four bytes in sequence. I'm just doing that using a uh, mask here. So I'm just masking the most significant bit and then shifting it uh, one bit at a time at the end of it. That's why I did it as a 32-bit word. It's just easier that way than, say, four individual bytes. Saves a few lines of code. And then, of course, uh, we, well, we start out by generating the one bit time, 562 microseconds, the carrier frequency, and then we have to determine via that masking if our current bit is a high or a low. If it's a high, then of course we have to wait the three bit times, dead time, to signify a one in the NEC protocol. But if it's a zero, then we only have to wait one extra bit time. Very, very easy. And that's it. It just repeats for all 32 bits. And one thing I forgot to mention uh, on the oscilloscope capture is I also noticed a uh, stop bit at the end of it. So it was actually had a 33rd bit on there, just a stop bit of one bit time. So I've added that in there at the end. And then I've just got a main routine here. All it does is calls the setup, defines the pins, and then it sends my infrared code to switch the record mode of my camera on. It waits five seconds and then I send the code to stop recording. Easy. And no surprises for guessing it didn't work first go. No, it wasn't Murphy's Law, as a matter of fact. I kind of expected it to possibly not work first go, and I'll show you why. So what I've done is I've hooked up my uh, logic analyzer here, because to analyze something like this, we really need to look at that code output. You can do it on an oscilloscope, or but a logic analyzer is easy. We can capture it here. Now, I've hooked up my uh, Saley logic analyzer to the LED output. I'm going to sample at 8 megahertz here, uh, more than fast enough. One meg sample is good enough, and negative uh, edge trigger here. So we'll start this, and I'll press my reset button on my Arduino. I've already downloaded the sketch, and looky what we have here. We have our code. That's exactly the same as what we saw on the oscilloscope. And if we go in here, we can look at that carrier frequency of the leading pulse there. And if you have a look on the right-hand side, I can't move my cursor over, but it says the pulse width is 16.8 microseconds, and the frequency is 29.9 kilohertz. Nowhere near the 38 uh, kilohertz that we actually need. No wonder it doesn't work. Why? Well, it's uh, pretty obvious, and uh, those people who are experienced with these sort of things probably already know. Because in my timing loop here, my IR carrier loop, I've assumed that it's 26 microseconds. Okay, I've rounded that down near enough to generate the uh, loop timing in here. That's not going to be a, a real major issue. The major issue here is this delayed microseconds. You see it's got 13. So we're expecting to get 13 microseconds delay. But look, we don't. We get 16.8. So there's another what, uh, 3.8 microseconds or thereabouts added to that. So it's not 13 microseconds, it's 16.8. But why? Because, well, let's assume that the delay microseconds routine is fairly accurate, okay? It's not going to be absolutely, you know, spot on, but it's going to be near enough. What's taking all the time? Well, the only other code in here 
is this digital write routine. And this digital write routine does actually take time. In this case, it takes a couple of microseconds to execute. And there's faster ways to do it, but we're just using the digital write routine because uh, that's the basic way in the Arduino. So let's compensate, tweak this thing. I am holding my tongue at the right angle. And let's take that, let's knock that, you know, three or four uh, microseconds off. Let's change that to nine microseconds and let's upload that. We've uploaded, we can go back in here, we can start this again, we can run run our Arduinos running. Oops, it's already captured it because I've got an auto uh, start routine in there and you'll notice that the timing is different. Look at this, 12.75 microseconds now and we're close to our 38 kilohertz. We're now 39.4 kilohertz and as I said, you don't have to be spot on, but that's going to be near enough and as it turns out, this now works. And sorry about the audio and video quality now. I'm at home actually uh, doing this. I don't have my main camera, so I'm shooting on my old compact. It's night, and uh, well, yeah, it's not going to be very good. Anyway, I have my uh, Canon camcorder here. I've got my Freetronics 11 down here. I've got an infrared LED hooked up and pointed to it via a 220 ohm dropper resistor. And if I press the uh, reset button here, it should start recording, and then five seconds later, should send the code again to switch it off. So let's give it a go. Bingo, it started recording, and it won't quite go to five because it took a second or two to boom, but there you go, works a treat. And just a small trap for young players here, with any sampling system like this, the resolution is going to be dependent upon your sample rate. Now we're sampling at 8 megahertz here, and you'll notice that it's over on the right hand side there, it's saying the pulse width is giving us that to three decimal places, or one nanosecond resolution. Well, that's obviously complete bullshit. It's saying it's 12.875 microseconds. It's not possible to get uh, one nanosecond resolution on that. But 8 megahertz is more than good enough um, to get the timing requirement for this particular application. But let's resample that at, say, a lower rate of 500 kilohertz. Now, if you invert 5, let's start that, capture it, and here we go. And if you invert 500 kilohertz, of course, you get uh, two microseconds. You'll notice that, there we go, it's jumping between 2 and 14 microseconds, but it's still showing two decimal places beyond that. That's the software not knowing what it's doing, and this might be tricking in you into thinking that that pulse width is precisely 14.00 microseconds when it's not your resolution isn't good enough to determine that in this case this really isn't quite good enough for this particular system it's almost in the ball ballpark but not quite anyway just be aware of that trap for young players so that's it very very simple to write your own code reverse engineer a protocol you don't even need an oscilloscope you can do it using very simple and basic tools a pc or whatever so no complex test equipment required here to reverse engineer that NEC protocol and, you know, not much work at all. Very, very simple. So I hope you enjoyed that. There were lots of stuff involved in this. Oscilloscopes, reverse engineering, and then uh, we had a little uh, fail there in our source code and tweaking, some logic analyzer stuff. It's all happening. Fantastic. So if you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EUV blog forum, and no correspondence will be entered into on the source code. Thank you very much. Catch you next time.